Welcome back to the second part of this two-part video on Dippy the Diplodocus, the most famous dinosaur in history. If you missed the first episode, go back and watch that now, because very little of what I'm about to say is going to make sense. But without further ado, let's get right back into it. Hatcher had just found a second specimen at Sheep Creek, and so, with this new material, it was time to start preparation and description of these two huge finds. Hatcher worked incredibly quickly at his description, taking less than a year, and too fast for the preparators Cogshaw, his brother, Peterson, and A.W. Van Kirk to keep up with, so many bones that were described were still being cleaned. The culmination of material discovered here, and over the years by other museums, meant that for the first time a full Diplodocus skeleton could be drawn in detail by Hatcher. This drawing was superb, but it was actually a Frankenstein's monster-like amalgamation of several different Diplodocus. The gaps in the two specimens found by the Carnegie Museum were filled by the first material found and drawn by Marsh. The two feet and four limbs and missing tail vertebrae came from Henry Fairfield Osborne's descriptions of two specimens found by teams at the American Museum of Natural History. However, in all this material, they still lacked a skull. The closest they got is that small fragment of back lower jaw. Sauropod skulls are particularly rare fossils to find, and even to this day no true Diplodocus skull has ever been discovered. Skulls of other Diplodocids have been found, but no Diplodocus. The way Hatcher got around this skull issue was to use the original drawings made by Marsh of what he thought a Diplodocus skull may look like, based upon other sauropods and two very fragmentary sections found in years following the original discovery in 1877. Despite using other specimens to create this drawing, Hatcher still decided that the two specimens found by the Carnegie teams were in fact a different species to Diplodocus longus, the species originally described by Marsh. The reason for this, as Hatcher states, is that the cervical ribs on the bottom of the neck vertebrae on the Carnegie specimens were shorter than those on the Marsh specimens. And secondly, the long spines on the top of the vertebrae at the base of the tail, called the neural spines, were angled far more backwards than those on Marsh's specimen. Size did not factor into the equation, as Hatcher theorised that like crocodiles, dinosaurs grew constantly throughout their lifetime. Hatcher then named it Diplodocus Carnegie, in honour of Carnegie, in a clear effort to curry favour writing to Carnegie, now the biggest thing on earth of its kind bears your name, so you are sure of immortality in the annals of science, a form of immortality which, I may say, scientific men greatly covet. He also sent a framed copy of his drawing to Carnegie. However, Hatch's proclamation of his Diplodocus, which he and others working on its reconstruction were now calling Dippy, being different from Longus, may have been premature. A few years after the release of his paper, it was discovered that the cervical vertebrae, with the long cervical rib that Marsh had described as Diplodocus, and on which Hatcher had then based half of his entire idea of Carnegie being a different species on, was actually from an Apatosaurus, nullifying half of the evidence Hatch Hatcher had. Hatcher released his findings, but did not mention these implications for his proclamation of Carnegie being different. The debate over Longus versus Carnegie still goes on to this day, especially over who should be the type species. Longus still maintains its place as the type species for Diplodocus, but it is tenuous. So we have learned how Dippy was discovered and described, but how did it get so globally famous and appear in museums all over the world? Well, it all began in autumn of 1902, when the fairly new King of Britain, Edward VII, was visiting Carnegie's Scottish residence known as Skibbo. He saw the framed sketch on the wall of Diplodocus Carnegie, which Hatcher had sent to him the year before. And just as the idea of a giant behemoth lizard walking the land had enchanted Carnegie, it now also enchanted the King of Britain. He immediately requested one for the British museum as he was a trustee there. Carnegie wrote to Holland telling him to get to work right away on creating a mountable cast for the king. This was no easy feat though, and very expensive. Holland hired two expert Italian modelers, paying them a wage of $100 per month that was a higher wage than most of the paleontologists in the museum were making. I think that showed the seriousness in which Holland took this assignment. One issue still remained though. Hatcher may have been able to fully draw a Diplodocus using an amalgamation of different drawings found, but they didn't actually have a lot of those physical bones in which to make moulds from. They only had the materials from the two specimens they had found at Sheep Creek. Luckily, very shortly after Hatcher had published his paper, Carnegie teams under one W.H. Utterback, a collector for the museum, had found two more specimens, though in different locales than Sheep's Creek. They were found near Casey, Wyoming, on the Red Fork of the Powder River. One of these digs found more parts of a skull, part of the back half, 
but nowhere near a complete one, but still it was something to go off. Ottoman specimens had included two front limbs, but the specimens were slightly too short for Dippy, so larger versions were cast. Originally they had used casts of an American museum specimen, but those turned out to be Camarasaurus, not Diplodocus. Despite this, the American museum still came in useful by making the cast of the chevrons and modelling a skull for them. This skull, like the Diplodocus, was an amalgamation of various parts of skulls that had been found, with a bit of imagination used to fill the huge gaps. In total, four individuals went into the skull, two of marshes from the US National Museum, one from the American Museum, and the small fragment of the back of the skull that W.H. Utterback had found. So in total, including the skull, Dippy herself is actually made up of about eight different Diplodocus, depending upon whether the chevrons from the American Museum came from the same specimen as that used in the skull from the American Museum. If it was, then it's only seven, but still that's amazing that it took so many specimens to complete a singular skeleton, displaying the true difficulty of fossil hunting. There could even have been more than one individual used to cast the chevrons by the American Museum, so it could be nine or even ten individuals. Sadly, records of rather unclear on this. The model was ready by 1905, and when it went on display at the Natural History Museum in London, it was the first time the world would see the full skeleton assembled, because fascinatingly, the original finds were still being prepared and wouldn't be on display until 1907, when a whole new section of the Carnegie Museum was completed to house it. The cast was erected in the classic Edwardian view of sauropods, with its tail dragging along the ground and its neck drooping down. The unveiling of Dippy at London was a monumental occasion, and the culmination of six years of work digging prepping, describing, casting, and modelling, which actually is not a lot of time when compared to a lot of modern paleontology, but the speed in which it was done highlights how important this dinosaur was. Carnegie was willing to throw an endless amount of money behind it to hire the best fossil hunters and paleontologists to get it done. I'm sure if modern paleontologists had the same money that Carnegie's crews had behind them, then things would go a lot quicker in science. The ceremony was attended by Carnegie Holland, Professor Ray Lancaster, director of the museum, and Lord Avebury, a famous polymath and liberal politician at the time. 200 other people attended the ceremony in the reptile hall, but the king himself did not. Instead, Professor Lancaster read out loud a letter the king had sent to thank Carnegie for his generosity. It did not stop there though. With moulds made of all the bones, it was possible to make a lot of full casts of the Diplodocus, and Holland and Carnegie saw an opportunity here. Holland wrote that gifts to any royal dinosaur recipients, kings or emperors, ought to bring a royal return more than a thank you. Carnegie had always had great visions of world peace, and he believed that being the richest man in the world meant that he could achieve it, and Dippy would now become his most important ambassador. He started off offering cars to other nations. Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany was next, yes, the very same Kaiser of World War I. The French also got one just afterwards. This is because German and French dignitaries had been at the opening of the new wing of the Carnegie Natural History Museum in Pittsburgh in 1907, and so Carnegie told Holland to offer cars to them. In Germany, when the cars was mounted, the Kaiser did not show, but Holland was treated to banquets and pomp. In Paris, a huge ceremony was held when President Falleres attended the unveiling. Next was Vienna and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1909. The Emperor Franz Joseph did actually turn up to accept the cast. Holland then went straight to Bologna, Italy, to present another to Italian King Victor Emmanuel III. After that came the Russians in 1910, as the Tsar's uncle had been in Paris and witnessed the ceremony there. Holland and Cogshaw actually broke the Russian cast when one of their team let go of a rope to back to Russian dignitaries when they entered the prepping room. They didn't have time to ship replacements, so they glued it all back together with cement paste. Next came the Argentinians. The President Penna requested a cast in 1912. Once again, Holland and Cogshaw were treated like royalty to feasts and grand tours of the country. By 1914, World War I was raging, but still requests came in. Spain, which remained out of the war, now requested one. Even making the transatlantic crossing as Americans was still dangerous with German U-boat operations trying to cut Britain and France off from supplies, but they crossed without incident and reached Spain. They met King Alfonso XIII and installed the Diplodocus. It was sadly clear to Carnegie that his dreams of world peace would not come to fruition, and what he thought would be a unifying power of dinosaurs actually turned into a scramble of nations trying to outdo each other when it came to natural history museums, and it created jealousy and rivalries. The Russians had felt left out and forgotten until 1910, when they had to request one themselves. The Germans insisted upon being first in line before the French, and so the French put on a huge display of pomp when theirs was unveiled, including rows of National Guard in dress uniform along the walk up to the museum. 
Carnegie died in 1919, but even after his death, Holland, now into his 70s, continued mounting work. In 1927, Professor Alfonso Herrera, director of the Mexican Natural History Museum in Mexico City, made a request for a cast. This would be Holland's last cast, but maybe the one that captured Carnegie's dreams of peace the best. In the late 1920s, relations between the USA and Mexico were sour. The Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1917 and the Zimmermann telegram sent by Germany to try and convinced Mexico to invade America had damaged relations and over the coming decades things got worse, with disputes over oil in the Gulf of Mexico, immigration disputes, and continued outbreaks of fighting in Mexico, worsening the climate. So Holland saw this request as a clear opportunity. He found an old half-completed cast left over from the heyday and got funding from Carnegie's widow Louise Whitfield to repair it, complete it, and send it to Mexico. The Mexican press leapt on the bandwagon and published article after article about the dinosaur. The Mexican ambassador to the US was also excited to have this opportunity to start bridging the gap between the two nations. The whole thing was completed and set up in Mexico by 1930, and with that Holland's final cast was completed, as he died two years later of a stroke in 1932. I feel it necessary to give a special nod to the work of Arthur and Lewis Cogshall, who were both key in casting and setting up the Dippy Mount, and both travelled the world with Holland to give them. Lewis went on the Mexico trip as Arthur left the Carnegie Museum sometime after his final mount in Spain in 1912. After Holland's death, one more international skeleton was given away to Munich in 1934, but it was never set up, and with World War II coming, it was largely forgotten about until the 1970s. Two more cars exist on display, one from 1989 in the Utah Field House of Natural History and State Park Museum, and finally in 1999, exactly a hundred years after the first discovery, an outdoor model was put up at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, this being the only one that is a full body model and not just the bones, but it's still Dippy. Carnegie's dinosaur really was the first globally known dinosaur. For many people, Dippy would have been the first ever dinosaur they saw. Dippy was so famous that songs and rhymes were made up about this dinosaur. Crown heads of Europe all make a royal fuss over Uncle Andy and his old Diplodocus. Dippy was always the first thing to greet us when me and Ben would go to the Natural History Museum in London. The new blue whale they installed in 2017 is very cool, but Dippy represents such a vast and rich history of paleontology. Dippy isn't just important to science, Dippy is important as a reminder of the gilded age of frontier paleontology, global politics and warfare, industrialization and the rise of America onto the world stage, diplomacy and one man's wish for world peace. When Carnegie's teams first dug out those bones of what they thought was a small brontosaurus, did they know they were digging up the most famous dinosaur specimen in history that would go on to be displayed in London, Berlin, Paris, Vienna, Bologna, St. Petersburg, La Pata, Madrid, and Mexico City. Some of the information for this video came from an amazing book I read called Bone Wars by Tom Rea. It goes far, far more into detail than could fit into this video and explores a lot of the other expeditions of prominent figures mentioned in this video like Hatcher. I highly recommend it as it's written in a narrative history style, making it incredibly fun to read like it's a work of fiction. This is in no way a sponsored video, but had I not read this book then I wouldn't have decided to make this video, so I believe it should be said. Thank you for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you'd like to learn more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it and if you'd like to see more from us.